HBC Digest Radio, welcome back to another uh, fascinating discussion on higher education in the historically black college university context. Today, we are privileged to be joined by Dr. Melanie Carter. She is an associate professor in the Howard University uh, new and, and burgeoning program in a PhD in higher education leadership and policy studies, where she is an associate professor here to talk with us today about the program and the benefits it yields for training the new co- cohort of leaders, uh, executives and decision makers in the HBC sphere. So Dr. Carter, did indeed a pleasure to have you on this morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Carter. I much appreciate it. Um, so Howard's PhD program in higher ed leadership, right? So if, if you've been following HU on Twitter, a lot of what you've seen lately, um, or a big tweet that got a lot of a lot of love online, has been uh, Dr. Frederick Wayne Frederick, President of Howard, talking about the the work that he does in his boardroom um, and some of the uh, engaging discussions he has with some of the PhD students in this program. Um, but for those who have not heard of it, can you describe a little bit about the program and why it's so important for Howard to have a stake in developing the future? Uh, president, CEOs, and other kind of executives in the in the HBCU sphere. Okay, that's um, that's an important question. The the program, the Higher Education and Leadership and Policy Studies program, um, the first cohort was admitted in the fall of 2018, mm-hmm. and so we're completing our our second full academic year of the program, and so um, it's really great and exciting to have um, the opportunity to really be a part of preparing the next leadership of HBCUs. The program was designed specifically to prepare people for higher education leadership roles um, across um, institutional type, but specifically um, at HBCUs or minority-serving institutions. And so we know that at Howard, we have a long history of preparing leaders um, in a whole host of areas, and certainly in education as well. And we know that it's critically important that people who work at HBCUs and support our students and our institutions are prepared to do just that, not 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 in um, not, not solely in traditional ways, but also understanding um, the contemporary um, uh, opportunities and challenges we have at our institutions and others, and and what um, leaders bring to bear um, on those institutions. So the opportunity to craft a program designed specifically to support those leaders and to address um, questions of concern and or interest um, was was especially important to us. So we're excited about the new program program and excited about the students um, in the program. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that curriculum, um, because Howard Mm -hmm. is going to be the third HBCU that has a higher education program with a specific focus on minority serving institutions, HBCUs, and -hmm. the challenges that go specifically with our kind of schools, Um, obviously joining Jackson State, Morgan State. So why is it important or what is it about the curriculum that allows students to see the, the specific and unique challenges to HBCU leadership versus higher education at large? Well, one of the things I like to say um, is that HBCUs, we do have a particular history, context, and purpose. Um, That doesn't mean that we are, you know, completely different from other institutions, so it's important to be grounded or to understand, you know, the literature, the research, the theories, best practices in higher education, um, you know, writ large. But there are some particular uh, there's some particular focus, particular information, particular context that is important um, in our settings. And so, for example, you began by talking about our president who is teaching the course on the presidency. Mm-hmm. So, again, his perspective as a university president and a president of an HBCU provides insight that would not otherwise um, be available to students in programs like this. So that's an example. I certainly teach um, this semester a course, a new course on black women in higher ed leadership, and it, it really... Um, is is an opportunity to really think deeply about what that means, what kind of um, <clears throat> policies and perspectives, and what do we bring to um, this space as women and as women's leaders. And so, um, and in addition to serving as associate professor, I'm also associate provost. And so, in terms of thinking about um, leadership and what that means in the HBCU context, certainly uh, the president and certainly um, I as well have some direct experience with that and are engaged in that on a daily basis. And so, um, I think that makes us unique in that regard, that we're certainly preparing our students to lead anywhere, but we believe there's a particular uh, focus or a particular um, 
world view, all right, or, or professional or mm-hmm. and leadership philosophy that that shapes um, how you lead a successful HBCU. So I the, think that makes us different. One of the things that's interesting about this program is it says in the title that there is a an intimate focus on policy. Uh, talk mm-hmm. a little bit about the examinations you take uh, from a curriculum standpoint, from an experiential learning standpoint, in helping students to understand the policy making elements, particularly at federal and state levels, because we know that that's critical. Um, Those rules can change with different administrations, different political parties. So how do you get them prepped for uh, to be nuanced about the the policy making element of the presidency? The issue is that certainly policy is something that begins with an idea. It's something that um, we certainly should shape and inform in our work. And so we certainly... uh, uh, take a lot of time making sure that students understand historically um, how policies have shaped and impacted our institutions, um, our role in helping to shape, inform, redirect, right, or even help to create or um, push forward policy that supports um, our work in our communities. And so that's extremely important. Ways in which, which is found in our in our, our um, curriculum. Um, certainly in the higher ed program, we have a policy course that deals specifically with higher ed policy that looks at, for example, the PROSPER Act and other mm-hmm. important um, policies that are affecting higher education today. We certainly look at other issues around uh, specifically higher ed finance policy, what that means, how we should um, certainly um, be prepared to interact with policymakers and other political leaders around these issues. And you're right, it's certainly these are certainly nonpartisan um, by and large issues. So the issue of friends and friendships um, in that arena become very important, not around necessarily um, a party affiliation, or, um, but really around our interests what's best for our institutions, for our students, and for our communities, and we have to be clear about that. So, for example, um, this semester, one of our um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Rodriguez, Rod- Rodriguez um, arranged for our students, <coughs> not only the higher ed program, but other program to meet on Capitol Hill with um, one of the senators, I believe Senator Bernie Sanders. We always um, have um, opportunities to engage um, uh, at, uh, with uh, policymakers and uh, advocacy organizations and, and lobbyists and others who are influencing those kind of discussions. And so that's deeply embedded in our program, and it's a part of how we envisioned our students being able to engage and to support and advocate uh, for our institutions. How difficult is it, I guess, in this current political climate, are the conversations in, in, in the classroom? where you're talking about, hey, this is this is the kind of work you have to do as an advocate. This is the kind of work you have to do as a lobbyist. But there's so much tension or political tension that students are aware of, uh, students in a class, mm-hmm. uh, in a cohort, I mean. And, sure. and, and that is combined with their own political views. And that is combined with the views that their future constituents may have. So how do you sure. kind of help those students work through, you know, your, your, your alumni and your students may feel a certain way. You may feel a certain way. And you let your lawmakers may feel a certain way, but you got to get mm-hmm. certain certain policy work done. Um, are there conversations that revolve around that? Um, yes, absolutely. But I also think it's important for students to understand that even though we're right now we're in a uh, challenging political environment and a lot of um, you know uh, chaotic behavior, certainly some um, behavior that uh, we're not it's, it's sort of new terrain in many regards. But the issue of contestation and um, challenge is not new um, in higher education or in K-12 through education. And so as a leader, um, the key, again, is to be consistent about your beliefs, your commitment to your your uh, students and communities and our institutions and to move forward that way. So, you know, having a friend um, or like-minded um, individuals, like-minded political uh, folks in power does not necessarily change the work that we must be prepared to do mm-hmm. so some of the um some of all the you know um, um emphasis on who is in office right now at a- at any level whether that is at the federal level state level or local level though important it can't be the determinant of our work nor of our analysis um, nor our reflection about how we're going to move forward so those conversations occur but i think it's important uh, certainly in my classes and i'm sure in others to not uh, carry there <laughs> um, in a way that's going to be paralyzing, but know that we, you know, we always have challenge mm-hmm. and a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so we got to uh, be prepared to move forward. 
what is the balance that you have to strike in your classes and that you find in the program to talk about the differences in leadership and leadership culture for public and private institutions? Because they can they have a lot of the same interests, but the approaches and the mission and the missions can be slightly different. And those slight differences can make big impact if you do it the right way or the wrong way. So how much do you Mm -hmm. do you do you train your students to say, you know, here's how it would go for a public, maybe a little bit different for a private. Here's how it would go working with TMCF. Here's how it would go working with UNCF. Well, you know, I think that one uh, last semester I taught history of higher education, mm-hmm. and for me, historical context is important for 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 all of this um, for any kind of analysis. And what what that means is that higher education, um, you know, um, in, a, in in the United States anyway, certainly. Uh, uh, it's very complex, very varied. There are all kinds of institutions, institu- institution types. They all have um, um, uh, very missions. Um, so th- I think it's important for us to understand that whether we're in a public space or a private space or working for an organization that's committed to um, our same ideas, um, that we have to understand uh, what, I mean, higher education in terms of what is it, Historically, why 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 it was created, why it exists, and how um, the institution, the higher education institutions, um, can um, support or you know support our help us to meet our goals and help our students to live the lives um, that we want them to lead in our communities to to flourish. And so, I do think it's important to know about um, the difference between private or public or whatever. And I try to, um, certainly in my classes, we talk about those differences and talk about the evolving nature of the private institution or the public institution and what that means, what that look like, look what that has looked like over time. And so, yes, I think, um, and I do, we, we, we talk all the time about a private versus a public or an HBCU uh, um, and uh, uh, MSI or, or PWI and or, or religion, religious-based institution or versus one that isn't. So all those differences make a difference in terms of how you approach a, a, a challenge, how you try to address it, and how you make sure that your institution um, is, um, is uh, sustainable over time. And so, yeah, I think I think our students are well versed in understanding those uh, those differences. Mm-hmm. Have you found in the in the last two cohorts uh, that you've helped to train up that a majority of your students find or have discovered through the course of this program that they have to be they got to be in love with this sector and they got to be in love with this job because one of the things that I think <clears throat> that knocks presidents off balance is that they get into a position and they've had a certain realm of training. And then they don't realize is, oh, I have weakness in fundraising. I have weakness in athletic mm-hmm. engagement. I have weakness in alumni engagement. I have weakness in student affairs. I have weakness in weakness in academic affairs. But I'm good at this one thing. So let me hammer home this one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, have mm-hmm. you found that the questions or the work that they've been, they've been doing have awakened them to you got to be you can be great at, at something, but you got to be really good at, <laughs> at a lot of other things. Exactly. A lot of things. Yeah. Um, I know. I I really uh, a question I a question I have all the time for the students in the cohort um, in the in, in the program is that many of the students arrive with a goal of becoming a college president. Mm-hmm. Okay, which I think is laudable. I mean, I think that's important. Um, but what I say to them, and this is something that really has really helped me um, in my work with the students, is that. Um, this work in higher education, and certainly at HBCUs, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Mm-hmm. And so they have to have a whole host of experiences um, in order to prepare them to serve as a president. That may not be in necessarily in the higher ed arena. It may be, you know, now certainly there are all a variety of trajectories um, that lead to the presidency. And in fact, I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. But I do think that there isn't one single experience that can prepare you to lead um, a university or to support the leadership of, the, of a university or lead in a variety of levels. There are a host, host of experiences. And so I don't think that any program prepares you to, you know, um, effectively um, work with your board or to, you know, make sure that 
you um, understand higher ed finances fully and will be able to make good decisions as president or that you understand what it means to, um, you know, work with faculty and um, um, deans and other academic uh, leaders. And so I think that that occurs over time and it occurs with um, experience. Um, it, it, it occurs with, um, you know, just um, getting down um, in the trenches and doing the work. And so um, I really think that there seems to be um, a notion that this can be captured and presented to someone as a sort of set of skills. You'll be able to, this is what you need, this is what you need, this is what you need. And I think certainly if you're looking at any kind of leadership role in higher education, you need a whole bunch of, of um, tools that don't, and many of them may not uh, be provided in any um, um, academic program. I mean, and so, well, you got to be able to identify the talent that has the tools. If yep, you don't have it, go. how do you find the person who has absolutely. it? Absolutely, can do it for you. Absolutely, <laughs> that's right. That's you, right. Do absolutely. You, do you find yourself telling anybody get out of this? Like this, this is crazy. Like this is a this is an industry that the bubble is bursting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of colleges, not HBCUs necessarily, but a lot of colleges closing. We see a lot of HBCUs in financial trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Do you ever just look up one day and just say, y'all are crazy as hell. Get out of this. Don't do this. <laughs> I know that that's, that's, that's treacherous to your program enrollment. Um, but, mm-hmm. do you, but do you ever find that you got to have those those real conversations with the people? Yes, I do. And not to say get out of it, but understand what you're getting into. I always say, you know, one of the things is that higher education um, is changing rapidly. Yeah. Um, with as we you know in the 21st century we're seeing decreasing enrollment we have issues around affordability our economy can we really afford um to go to um a university what does that mean and so forth so those are important questions because all of our institutions whether HBCUs or PWIs public private um I always say uh, I always when I talk about HBCUs I often talk about HBCUs or similarly situated institutions um Sweetbriar I mean we can list the many others mm-hmm. So it is a very, very, very um, um, challenging time for higher education. And we know if that's true for all of higher education, what that means for HBCUs or similarly situated institutions. Exactly. So you have to be um, not only passionate, you got to have a plan, a strategy, and you have to be forward-thinking, uh, flexible, you have to be committed to uh, challenging traditional notions about what institutions look like or will look like in the next, it's not even long term, short term, 5, 10, 15 years. And that's, that, that's, that's really, really um, makes this field exciting, but it also makes it, it makes people who want to work in this area um, field vulnerable. Yeah. And you have to be willing to, to, to embrace that. This, this, I could do this all day, and, I, and we only got okay, 20 minutes, so it's actually my fault because you're, you're on a roll, and I, I could ask oh, you no, 50 questions. No, I enjoy it. Let me, let me just ask you this. How, for people who are listening um, across the country and around the world, mm-hmm. can you tell us where we can get more information about the program, uh, how to apply, uh, where, to, where to find more info online, all the good stuff? Sure, absolutely. Our program, certainly, you can visit the School of Education's website, Howard University School of Education website, which um, I don't have the actual, I can look, um, thing, but certainly go to Howard University, Google Howard That's fine. University, Google School, Howard of University School of Education. School of Education. <laughs> right. You can it certainly go to our department, which is Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. Um, the the deadline has passed. I believe the, the annual deadline is late fall for um fall um we admit a, a cohort per year so we've already actually selected the cohort cohort for fall um 2019 oh my things go so quickly yeah. um but again <laughs> very very quickly so um that's true and we try to uh, make sure that we have a nice mix of students with varied experiences and backgrounds who um, have shown a commitment um to to leading um HBCUs or, or MSIs, and so uh, we we've been fortunate to have great applicants, and fortunate to have great folks who actually become a part um, of the cohort each year. So we're we're actually anticipating our third cohort, and look forward to uh, many years of uh, of great students.